Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. Uh, my name is Atarud Azizi Namini, director of the IBT slash ABC UTC. Before we proceed, I wanted to share with you some really good news. Um, we are not uh, at the point to tell you which hotel the conference is going to be held, but the name of the conference starting this year is this year is going to be 2024 World Bridge Engineering Conference. As you know, the IBT slash ABC, the UTC, is going to be basically involved in all aspects of the bridge engineering, both existing and the new, with the focus on basically bringing the innovative technologies into the bridge engineering. And so uh, we will have uh, participants from around the world so the name of the conference uh, starting uh, in 2024 will be World Bridge Engineering Conference. The date is set December 11 to 13. This time we are going to have three days of technical presentation. There will be no workshop. So there will be three days of uh, presentation on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The hotel is in Miami, Florida. Uh, we are in next week. Uh, the contract is going to be signed and during the next webinar we will announce the, the name of the hotel. So um, the call for abstract is going to be issued uh, very soon. In fact, in December, uh, uh, look for the announcement for the call for abstract to show up in different magazines, trade magazine, technical, and the, like ASC and, and so on. So. We hope that to see many of you who have enjoyed uh, listening to monthly webinar and our other um, technology transfer activity to mark your calendar and be and in the conference so that we have a chance to meet you face to face. So more information is going to be shared during our next uh, uh, webinar. So at this point, I'm going to turn it to Cathy Kroll. Now back to this month's webinar, we're pleased to feature the Fervical Concrete Bridge Rehabilitation Utilizing UHP FRC in Switzerland. Our presenter is Professor Eugene Bruweiler. Since 1995, he is a professor and doctor of structural engineering and director of the Laboratory of Maintenance and Safety of Existing Structures at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. His teaching and research activities include methods of bridge examination of structural and fatigue safety by means of data for monitoring, as well as the use of ultra high performance fiber reinforced cementitious composites for the rehabilitation and strengthening of existing reinforced concrete structures and the design and construction of new UHP FRC structures question and answer session will be moderated by Paul Lyles, the former state and bridge engineer for Georgia Department of Transportation, and by Jamal El Kaisi, who is a structural engineer in the FHWA's Resource Center. I'd like to thank Ali Javid for his help with managing the webroom and keeping us all coordinated. So now I'll give the screen controls to Professor Bruweiler. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, good evening for those in Europe. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present a recent uh, UHPFRC application in Switzerland. I subdivided uh, my uh, presentation into three parts. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce UHPFRC just to uh, have uh, a same level for everybody, the same understanding. The main part is, of course, the Perpacle Bridge project. And finally, I would like to conclude with uh, some application concepts and lessons learned from uh, more than 150 uh, projects. So what is UHPFRC? It is composed of a cementitious matrix containing also other particles than just cement. And we have a huge amount of uh, slender steel fibers. So it's a composite material. And we call it ultra high performance fiber enforced cementitious composite. It's not the concrete. I think it's important to state that 
because when you say concrete, you think concrete and you build like concrete. It's a different material. It's a composite material. And uh, yes, of course, we have also UHPCs, which is a, a name and abbreviation that is uh, also very often used, in particular in the US. What is the performance of tensile strain hardening UHPFRC? I will insist on this tensile strain hardening property. So again, the material itself is impermeable with respect to water or chloride ions because we have a compact optimized matrix. Nothing is going into the material. And then we have a very high uh, content of uh, fibers of slender steel fibers you see here the size and usually use more than three volume percent in order to get a tensile strain hardening behavior which we have here so this is the behavior beyond the elastic limit of the material and prior to arriving to the tensile strength beyond the tensile strength we have a softening behavior the compressive strength is around is at around 25 ksi, so uh, the tensile strength at 2 ksi. So we still have a ratio of about 1 to 10 or 12 uh, between compressive uh, tensile and compressive strength. Modulus of elasticity at 7,000 ksi. Um, the material is watertight and crack-free under service conditions. I will explain that in a minute. And I would like to mention that in the Swiss standard, we classify our UHPFRC uh, as a function of the tensile properties, not the compressive strength. Now, it is very um, advantageous to uh, combine UHPFRC with steel reinforcement bars that uh, act in the main stress direction. It is very economic to do that cost-wise and also from a mechanical viewpoint it's interesting and uh, when we analyze uh, this uh, section consisting of steel rebars and UHPFRC it is quite easy to do. It's simply the superposition of the UHPFRC and rebar responses. Now, let me uh, make a remark regarding uh, the fiber content about uh, UHPFRC with tensile strain hardening behavior. As I said, we have a relatively high fiber content in order to have this tensile strain hardening behavior. And the reason is actually serviceability. UHPFRC is in particular interesting in the serviceability domain. And in the serviceability domain, we do not have strains significantly larger than one per mil. So this means for deformation up to about one per mil of strain, we should have a material that is crack free. In the hardening domain, the material has what I call smeared matrix discontinuities. But uh, our tests showed that in this domain, the material is watertight. That's very important for application. Cracking in the understanding of reinforced concrete occurs only when we have uh, arrived at the uh, uniaxial tensile strength at strains larger than two per mil. Now, when we have lower fiber content, and I intentionally call this material UHPC, usually has no tensile strain hardening. What happens, we have a, an elastic domain. We come to the, what is usually called the first cracking strength, and then we have the descending softening branch. Or if their fiber content is very low, we have a drop and softening. And cracking occurs already uh, when we arrive at the first cracking strength. So this means then we are in the middle of the serviceability domain when cracking occurs. 
So cracking the softening domain at small deformation, and we uh, need to count uh, with ingress of water and chloride ions in this domain. And the significant reduction in stiffness when it comes to structural performance. That's why I'm insisting on UHPC or UHPFRC with tensile strain hardening. Now let's look uh, at the map of little Switzerland in the heart of Europe. Uh, until today, we have about 400 realized UHPFRC projects since 2004. All of them have been realized with UHPFRC with tensile strain hardening behavior. Or in other words, with uh, fiber contents of 3% or larger. Of course, there is a concentration of projects uh, near my uh, home university. But now we would like to look at the Furpackle Bridge, which is located here in the southern part of Switzerland in a very beautiful remote mountainous area. So let's go to the bridge site. And this is the uh, post tension concrete bridge from 1985. It's a single span structure successfully in service over now 65 years with a span of 115 uh, feet and a height that is one uh, one 20th of the span. So it's a very slender single span structure. You see here an impression from uh, the construction drawings of the post tensioning. It is actually one of the first post tensioned uh, bridge structures in Switzerland. And up here we have the uh, a project team, the owner that uh, asked us to uh, develop the concept of uh, strengthening and widening of the existing bridge. And we did uh, at EPFL also the detailed uh, design of, this, of the project. Then we have a local engineering firm who is doing all the tendering and the local uh, quality control the daily control uh, during the works. And we have a local contractor doing all the works necessary here, not just the UHPFRC works. So let's come to the project. So we have a single span uh, post-tensioned uh, girder. And uh, the width of the DEX lab of the useful uh, DEX lab is only 17.5 uh, feet for bi-directional uh, traffic. And uh, in view of modern traffic re um, requirements, we need to widen significantly the DEX lab. Now, how can we do that? Given that actually, when we analyze the existing structure, we have uh, insufficient uh, structural safety. On the other hand, we determined in the uh, assessment phase of the project a compressive strength of the existing concrete of about 6.5 KSI, which is uh, very high. And this has to do with, uh, of course, the well-known increase in compressive strength of concrete over time. This is a very positive uh, property of concrete. And we will exploit that. Now, the conceptual design of the intervention. So we need to widen the cross section, the DEX lab in particular, and we will get significantly higher loads, both uh, self weight and traffic loads. And we are lucky in having as abutments uh, piers. So the abutments are here, uh, two uh, significant uh, piers, and they are reinforced. And we would like to exploit that. So on the uh, on the one hand, these piers allow to fix the single span girder into uh, this pier or with this pier, and of course it also acts as a counterweight. So the idea, the conceptual idea, the basic one is to create a monolithic hyperstatic structure, like a half frame here, using UHPFRC and nothing else than UHPFRC. 
all the green lines here are UHPFRC. So we need a very thick uh, UHPFRC uh, layer, including a significant uh, amount of rebars in order to have here a very strong uh, tension cord taking negative bending moments and also taking together with uh, the girder higher shear forces. So that's the uh, conceptual uh, design. We are lucky because we can uh, widen the bridge symmetrically. So the Pi uh, girder system, the original one, will again be under quite symmetric load apart from, of course, traffic loads that can be uh, placed on the cross-section asymmetrically. But from the dead, uh, dead weight uh, viewpoint, we uh, are symmetric. So you see here the dimensions of uh, uh, the UHPFRC layer, strengthening layer on top of the, of the existing uh, reinforced concrete deck and then the widening using a cantilever slab, a new one with curves. This is the cross section on the abutments where we have a thicker UHPFRC layer of three inches, while before we had, uh, what was that, two inches in about. And uh, yes, very specific. Of course, in Switzerland, we always put the pavement on the UHPFRC. Actually, as a remark, we also now have uh, methods in order to drive directly on the UHPFRC. But in this project, we will add in the coming days a layer of asphalt pavement. Now, in this cross section, uh, you also see here the filling up uh, in order to create a monolithic keying area with UHPFRC. To uh, summarize the modification of the static system, because this is uh, really important to understand, the initial static system is a single span beam, very easy to an uh, analyze. Then when we did our uh, analysis under service conditions, we were looking at the elastic system and fully fixed girder in the two peers. And at ultimate limit state, we assumed conservatively a certain um, uh, partial fixity by using a, a spring constant with uh, subsequent uh, reduced uh, moments here. And the trick is, of course, to have uh, a maximum moment at mid-span uh, such that we exploit the uh, ultimate uh, bending resistance at mid-span in the sagging region. And then we redistribute the remaining moment to take over the negative hogging moment uh, domain. This is allowed when we uh, apply theory of plasticity at ultimate limit state. Um, also part of the concept is, of course, uh, the construction site, how to organize it. Uh, essentially, it's a procedure in two main phases. We always need to have one traffic lane open, uh, yes, for road traffic at all the time. Now. I would like to show you an, an, an just the main uh, hand calculations, the main results. You do not need to read all, all this, but actually the pre-design uh, hand calculation, uh, I did it on some uh, pages and in maybe two, three hours time, it's not more complicated. And of, co of course the objective of such a hand calculation is to get a more precise idea of the dimensions, in particular the thickness of UHPFRC and the rebar diameters to put into the UHPFRC layers. So first of all, we uh, 
determine the demand in hogging bending resistance. Uh, I try to uh, translate that in uh, pound foot uh, value, just to give you an order of magnitude. And the same for the shear force that needs to be uh, taken always per bridge half. This is the value that we need to check afterwards, afterwards whether we have, with the strengthened system, sufficient capacity to take that shear force. And this is the design of the RUHBFRC layer, the rebars in the UHBFRC layer. We determine um, the force that we can develop using the rebars, of course, in the UHBFRC layer and the tensile force that the UHBFRC can develop at ultimate limit state. So we have 881 kips that can be uh, activated. And then, of course, we need to uh, determine the internal lever arm in order to obtain finally the moment capacity, the negative moment capacity uh, in the abutment. And finally, we check uh, structural safety. We need to have finally a value resistance over action effect that is larger than one, which is the case. So with these dimensions, we have a reserve of 17%. So pre-design pre is always a bit uh, conservative. Uh, it's easier afterwards in the detailed design. Similar for shear. And for shear, we have uh, uh, developed already some years ago a uh, resistance model, which is the summation of the contribution of uh, concrete, the steel reinforcement, the vertical one, consisting in our case here of uh, stirrups and, of course, the post-engineering post uh, steel. And then there is also a third contribution due to the existence of the RUHBFRC layer here. This main membrane that uh, has actually the function to uh, confine our reinforced or post post tensioned uh, element here in order to activate higher shear force, higher shear resistance, in particular the contribution of concrete. Here also we could uh, easily uh, verify sufficient structural safety with the dimensions uh, found in the pre-design. Of course, afterwards, once we go to the construction project, uh, there is the detailed structural analysis using the finite element model, which has been done by, by my uh, coworker. Uh, and, and this is to confirm the dimensions to uh, study and observe the deformation under extreme load conditions and so on, as you certainly know very well. Now, there are some more verifications, in particular in the transverse direction, when we look at the slab between the two uh, girders and, of course, the new cantilever slab in our UHBFRC. So um, after the uh, concept, after the uh, design considerations and calculations, uh, we would like to go on the construction side. And uh, here you have the first photo from uh, the 3rd of May this year when the construction site started uh, with, the form, uh, with the scaffolding. And in order to make an inter the, the intervention on the first bridge half. So we look here on June uh, 2nd on uh, one half that is in service. I should have taken a photo with a car or something on it rather than pedestrians. And on the right hand side, the works are ongoing and the concrete, the curbs were actually cut and the uh, top 
layer of the existing concrete was removed by hydro demolition, about one inch was removed. And here we have a look at the uh, uh, cut surface uh, when the curbs were removed. And also on top here, you see the uh, surface after hydro demolition. We inserted here rebars more for constructive purposes in order to have um, a reinforced uh, link with the cantilever, with the new cantilever slab also on the compression side. Now, this is a view of the casting of the UHPFRC. We have here on the left side, we can recognize the top surface of the concrete of the remaining slab. And here on the right hand side is the new cantilever slab and underneath, of course, the formwork. So everything was cast in one uh, casting. The whole length of the bridge was done in uh, two stages, in two days, essentially. We have to uh, look at the working joint in a minute, but here on the details, you can see here, once again, the details from the construction drawings uh, over the uh, support, over the uh, abutment, we have significantly larger reinforcement than in the uh, sagging moment uh, domain over the, uh, over the existing slab. Some other impressions, and you see here a vibrating needle. Uh, of course, UHPFRC or UHPC is self-compacting uh, material. It doesn't need to be vibrated. And you, it's even, you should really not do, uh, you should really not vibrate fresh UHPFRC. But here, the vibrating needle is just used in order to facilitate the flow. Because we have a tixotropic uh, mix, the tixotropic fresh material, because we have a significant slope of 5%. So we need a relatively stiff uh, material that can hold this relatively high slope. And in order to be sure that uh, at certain structural details, the material will for sure flow in all the little corners, we use a vibrating needle to facilitate the flow. Okay, so then I came back on the on the uh, August uh, seven to see the final result of the UHBFRC casting of the first half, and let's look here under the uh, cantilever slab, which is in dark gray UHBFRC, and the bright gray is the concrete, the original concrete from 1958. So all is uh, of course monolithic. And then my co-workers installed here an optical fiber for monitoring because we would like to use this case also uh, for research reasons. So this is not a requirement uh, from the project. This is our um, need and our motivation to do research on this structure, to understand how the uh, modification of the structural system is really working. So let's have a look at this uh, cantilever slab in UHPFRC in green here. Um, we've reduced the size of the curb to the minimum necessary. And this is a significant difference to uh, curbs in reinforced concrete that would be uh, much thicker and much fatter. And uh, I use this uh, drawing also in order to explain one little problem we had. Actually, during the um, hydro uh, jetting, the workers found that uh, here, this domain in red of the existing concrete was like a layered concrete with relatively low strength. Fortunately, the 
bottom part of the slab was, however, in excellent condition and had a very high strength. So I need to needed to look at the design in order to verify whether it's possible to uh, neglect the middle part of the concrete as a contribution to the uh, uh, shear resistance and of course also bending resistance and then I could confirm that actually this is possible to leave it as it is as a low strength concrete and to rely on of course the UHPFRC here as a tension cord and then the reaction force and compression can be taken by a sufficient amount of uh, healthy concrete. Still on August uh, 7, yes, this uh, slide in order to show the working joint in the longitudinal direction. This, of course, has to be done in such a way that the working joint will be watertight. And the structural detail we use for many years in Switzerland is a lapped joint with a, a horizontal contact surface where a bond is created between the two UHPFRC layers that are consecutively uh, cast. And this uh, guarantees actually uh, a waterproof uh, joint, which we verified, by the way, by means of testing. Now on September 26, uh, the uh, curb of the cantilever slab was, was cast here on this photo. And two days before September 24, the UHPFRC layer on top of the uh, reinforced concrete uh, slab was cast. So again, here, this gives you an impression of the reinforcement in the UHBFRC curve. And again, this structural detail in order to have a watertight uh, working joint. Some other impression, of course, curing uh, very quickly after casting, a curing compound is applied and then with plastic foil, the uh, uh, curing over some days is uh, performed. As you can see here, these are plastics foils uh, on top of the material, the UHPFRC that has been cast some days before. So let's have a look at the cost. That's always a tricky issue. And please keep in mind that uh, the level of cost or the cost of living in Switzerland is quite different for the one you know, in the US. But the prices uh, are as follows. For the UHPFRC layer on the concrete substrate of a thickness of roughly uh, two inches in average, this costs 25 US dollar per square foot. Now, the massive concrete on the forward of the cantilever slab is about 3,000 US dollar per cubic yard. And this includes, of course, the surface preparation of uh, the slab, hydro demolition, the forework for the cantilever slab, of course, the casting, curing, everything that goes with it. And then also, uh, always a question that uh, I need to ask is, what is the material cost in Switzerland? 40 cents per pound or 1,800 US dollar per cubic yard. This is the material cost when you buy it uh, at uh, the supply. Now let's have a look at the results. You see on the right hand side, the UHPFRC surface of the curve, some days later on October 4, and there are some bubbles just in this uh, zone. So this can, occur that uh, sometimes there, is, there are some bubbles, but it's just the same like for concrete. But the other surfaces are without bubbles. And also, of course, we are looking after cracks and uh, usually there are absolutely no cracks. Because when you cast a curve 
in reinforced concrete to an existing slab or a slab that is older, then you have uh, transverse cracking. You cannot avoid that. But in our case, we uh, have higher requirements. We do not want to have cracks in the curves. So this is the view under the second this uh, cantilever slab. And our technician here is uh, preparing the surface along the girder in order to install the second optimal optical fiber sensor for our research purpose. Now, what is the condition right now? This is a picture taken uh, last Friday. They are installing here uh, the walkway on the bridge and they are now doing uh, the works in order to complete the road before and after the bridge structure. All works have to be finished on October 27th. Now, the lessons learned from this project, it's very important to have a very clear structural concept that everybody needs to understand. Simple hand design is uh, interesting and sufficient in order to determine the main dimensions, but then we complement uh, this design by finite element analysis in order to validate the design. Clear tendering documents, of course, are important, like for all projects, strict quality control according to our standard. The requirements need to be very clear, the testing methods, and also the correction measures need to be uh, fixed in the tendering phase already. And very important also, suitability tests. It's uh, interesting to uh, uh, have like a training of uh, the contractor, of the workers, and this helps really to fine tune the execution. And we have much less uh, difficulties during the execution of the UHBFRC works. So overall, we had no notable issues regarding UHBFRC execution uh, quality and also regarding the cost. The costs that were fixed with the con tractor at the beginning of the project, they will be uh, uh, realized at the end. So let me now uh, finalize my presentation um, in summarizing some uh, application concepts from uh, our almost 400 uh, projects, and most of them are on road bridges, and some lessons learned from this experience. Of course, we use UHBFRC in order to enhance the performance of existing reinforced and post-tension concrete structures that are uh, that have shown that uh, they are not certain parts of the structure are not durable enough. But the UHBFRC layer helps to protect the uh, reinforced concrete by means of a robust watertight layer. And also the UHBFRC layer incorporating rebars helps to increase effectively structural capacity. And by the way, by applying this UHBFRC uh, technology, we can actually rescue existing reinforced concrete structures. And this helps to preserve uh, existing structures, to preserve embodied energies, and this is in most cases, a significant contribution to sustainability, also because uh, the cost and economic situation is much more interesting compared to uh, the, uh, let's say, traditional demolition replacement project. So that's also a message I would like to make. UHPFRC can do much, much more than just overlays. Now, application concepts. I think we have seen these uh, three concepts now with the application case. We strengthen and widen the deck slab of a bridge. Um, we increase the resistance, the structural capacity of uh, girders while uh, strengthening significantly the hogging moment domain. And the third application concept is to 
uh, close to, um, uh, to, to, to proceed to joint closures wherever there are joints. You can close all joints up to a bridge length of, uh, let's say, 100 yards. And uh, this means that uh, almost all joints that, uh, that we have on our road network could be uh, removed by using UHPFRC. Other application concepts, uh, more in the domain of steel structures. In the United States, you have uh, many large spans, nice, very beautiful bridges, large span bridges, suspension bridges with OSD, orthotropic steel decks, with the problem that there are many uh, fatigue cracks. And this can be strengthened with a layer of UHPFRC or the stiffness is increased such that the stresses, the fatigue stresses in the welds are reduced. And also on existing steel bridges, composite bridges, it is sometimes really uh, advantageous to replace the heavy reinforced concrete slab by a lightweight UHPFRC slab. And when I say lightweight, it's about three times lighter than a reinforced concrete slab. And with this uh, lightweight uh, solution, we can avoid strengthening of the steel structure. And of course, finally, application concept is rehabilitation of uh, uh, reinforced concrete when there are uh, uh, rebar corrosion damage and other damages. So let me... Uh, Finalize also uh, our first application in Switzerland was almost 20 years ago. It was about 3.1 cubic yard of UHPFRC, and 10, day, 10 years after, it was 1,000 times more. That was casted on the 1.3 miles long uh, Chion viaducts. But the technology is uh, more or less the same. Of course, the logistics has uh, significantly changed. So by now we have more than 350 uh, known applications in, in Switzerland. And of course the question is why? And uh, the answer is very simple. It is cost effective. It has to do with cost. It's, it means lower cost than uh, other solutions like traditional uh, retrofitting or demolishing and replacing and all that is much more expensive and more invasive also. So the material cost, as I mentioned already, is here. And then what's re what is really important is the construction cost. The cost per uh, square feet of useful uh, bridge deck surface, for example. This is the language we should uh, uh, speak when we compare cost. And then, of course, on level three and four, we have uh, we consider indirect user costs that can be reduced because uh, by means of the UHPFRC technology, we can accelerate very significantly uh, the uh, construction works and reduce indirect user costs. And uh, we can expect from uh, the resulting uh, structures improved by uh, UHPFRC that the maintenance uh, will be reduced. So this comes in addition as value. Okay, in Switzerland we have as a basis uh, two documents. First of all our standard that I translated into uh, English and I made out of it uh, something like a model standard that can be available for all interested uh, persons. And we have recently published by the Swiss Federal Roads Office a documentation, it's a 100 page document on UHPFRC for the maintenance and construction of art structures of the road infrastructure, where um, all the concepts and design methods and uh, experience in execution and so on is described in here. This uh, fur packing bridge uh, project will be presented uh, in some days at the fourth Swiss UHPFRC day. 
and next year in April at the IMC Symposium in Manchester. Let me conclude. So, um, personally, I have the experience of really bringing the UHPFRC technology, uh, of course, we began with research, from the lab to the field. It's a journey of uh, which it has lasted now for 25 years almost. And let me summarize the, let's say, um, the experience. It is very important to have a focused state of mind. You really need to want it. And you have to go for it. Like uh, sports people, they have a, an objective and they do everything for it. So it needs an exclusive uh, commitment. It is not just uh, like a special concrete. Over the day, you do uh, traditional reinforced concrete and in the evening, you do some UHPC. No, you have to spend the whole day on your UHPC or UHPFRC. And of course, very important, it's about convincing others in, to change their mindset. And of course, uh, I can imagine that uh, some of you have uh, faced already the situation of a project. However, the costs are very high. A UHPFRC uh, project with high costs. And here I must say, when I encounter such situations, then of course, first of all, I question the project. It's probably an ineffective a project from the conceptual uh, viewpoint already. And then I observed that in uh, some countries, there are unnecessary regulations. It's very complicated, uh, the validation procedure. Uh, so people are just not motivated to do something uh, uh, new. And then uh, third, the UHPFRC market is not functioning. And this means high prices. And with this, I would like to Thank you for your attention. Yes, it was a very interesting presentation, and we do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, we'll go ahead and get some that came in uh, beforehand, um, before the presentation. We have a bunch of them, mostly involving construction, that came in during the presentation. But the first one I have here is, can you comment on the potential benefits of combining UHP, FRC with pre-stressing methods? I think this question refers to uh, the new construction of uh, structures using uh, post engineering, like the road structure that is on my last slide. This one is uh, post tension, and actually it's very interesting to, to uh, pre-stress uh, UHPFRC. <coughs> um, when you design uh, new structures, new lightweight structures in UHPFRC and you use uh, pre-stressing, you will realize that it is uh, much easier to uh, place the uh, post-tensioning cable, let's say, in a, in a straight arrangement. You have less to battle the uh, very high self-weight of uh, post-tension concrete because the self-weight of uh, UHPFRC structures is much uh, smaller, one-third, one-quarter of what you know from reinforced concrete. And in this way, uh, the post-tensioning becomes more effective. It's maybe not so good answer. I really invite you to make the experience and design, um, yeah, the structure in which we are seeing. You will see. Okay. Uh, the second question in the design was, how was the overhang issue resolved? Was the width reduced for calculation of the section? Now, I do not understand the term overhang. Overhang is, uh, uh, you mean the cantilevering part? Yeah, the the, uh, the cantilevers. Yes. Um, so the cantilever slab was, of course, a uh, project requirement, the span of the cantilever slab. And then it's uh, the, uh, it's probably the question about the uh, active width of the girder with the post tensioning in it, mm -hmm. plus the slab part. So here we applied the, uh, let's say, usual, usual conventional uh, uh, formulas that you find in standards 
for reinforced concrete structures for the uh, active uh, width of uh, of uh, of a T girder. Okay, that's fine. Um, the question here was uh, came in beforehand about the modulus of elasticity and the shear strength of UHP um, FRC using the design calculations. Yes, in the design calculations, we used the modulus of elasticity of 7,000 KSI. And uh, probably what you mean is a shear strength, a direct shear, mm -hmm. which does not really exist, but uh, a value, a fair value would be something like 0.6 KSI. Okay. Um, what were the effects of temperature gradients in the girders? The effects were relatively uh, low or relatively small in the present project. This is uh, something we studied with the detailed finite element analysis. So it's not different to what you know from uh, traditional bridges in, in uh, reinforced concrete. Okay. All right. We had a question here about uh, commenting on the specifications. And we also had another question that came in during the presentation. And they wanted to know if the specifications would be available. <laughs> uh, I uh, recommend you to 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 uh, read the standard. Actually, we take the specifications, we adapt the specifications for a given project using our standard as a basis. That's it. Okay. Um, then a uh, final question in uh, the, the design phase. The, early questions. Do you have any other design examples where uh, this type of design was used? Uh, the design I, I presented, this, this hand calculation, oh, I did it on, on many projects like this. It's actually also, I, I teach the method also to my students for many years. So it's nothing uh, uh, spectacular in the end. Okay. But what, one advice is, when you do such uh, design calculations, one needs to be very clear. And one needs to know what one is doing. Okay. Um, question that came in on construction. We'll go to some of those. And we do have some other ones that came in uh, during the presentation. Uh, Caltrain has used UHPC in small batches to splice precast girders. Uh, they were wondering if there's any different methods you'd use when batching large quantities of your UHP FRC. Yes. Uh, this is a question about the logistics on the construction site. When you have large quantities to, to, to cast, as I have shown uh, just some slides before, the, the tools change. You, you get machines when you have large quantities to cast. Uh, like like uh, finishers, uh, otherwise it's not possible to do that by hand or, or whatever. So um, the company, the contractor, just adapts the equipment as a function of uh, the works that need to be done. Okay. Um, a question that came in beforehand is, how was the non-redundancy of the bridge handled during construction? Ah, here I suspect that non-redundancy uh, for U.S. engineers is actually a pie girder. Yeah. Is non-redundant. Just two girders. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are only two girders. Um, we do not consider it in this way. However, of course, we checked all the uh, uh, temporary phases and with eccentric traffic and with half of the bridge uh, Bit demol demolished and so on. Of course, you have to check these uh, temporary phases with respect to structural safety. And uh, this is what I would call as, as redundancy, as, as uh, mastering uh, this, this aspect. Okay. And we had several questions here along this uh, coming question. Uh, the first one was How do you ensure the bond between the old concrete and the uh, UHP FRC? Yes, this is a very basic question. So very important is the surface preparation. And in Switzerland, we do it by high pressure water jetting. And this gives you a nice rough surface 
-hmm. And just prior to casting the UHPFRC material, you have to wet the surface. So the surface needs to be moist. You touch the surface by, with, with your hand in order to feel it is moist, and then it's good to cast the UHPFRC on it. However, you have to avoid standing water, of course. And uh, by doing uh, so, we uh, obtain a perfect bond. What do I mean with perfect bond? When we do pull-off tests, then we need to observe fracture in the substrate concrete, not at the interface. That's the quality control. Okay. okay. Uh, then another question here about uh, how, do the construction joints during stage construction need to be roughened? This yes. is just in, the, in your uh, new yes. concrete. Okay. The, in particular, the horizontal contact surface of the lap joint needs to be uh, cleaned and micro roughed again with a high pressure water jet. Okay. Uh, then uh, casting stage one over two shifts, where their construction, where were the construction joints located? Uh, you mean the the transfers uh, working joints? Well, yeah. Did you have one there? Uh, yes. So the working joints were planned. They uh, were imposed and uh, were respected in the end on the construction site. So you had a header there or something to stop the concrete from flowing? Yes, okay. yes. All right, that's fine. Um, then can you describe um, curing needs for control of shrinkage cracking considering the higher leaf strength? Uh, so curing is, is a very similar to uh, curing of other cementitious uh, materials. Uh, apply immediately a curing compound and then plastic foil or thermal isolating mat, mat uh, depending on the outside temperature, of course. And then the duration of curing is, is given as a function of the outside uh, temperature. And okay. uh, it's probably a bit uh, conservative for UHPFRC, but we do not want to take any risk. The result is very good. We have no uh, shrinkage cracks. Okay. Uh, how many days of curing are needed? Typically, it's uh, three to four days in post. Okay. Uh, and uh, three or four days. And is what's the time between laying the UHP FRC and opening the bridge to traffic? Um, in case we, we uh, put the layer of uh, asphalt on top of it, we have to wait one week after casting in order to uh, put the asphalt layer on the UHPFRC. So roughly eight days. Okay. And uh, were there differences in cure time between the deck and the abutment uh, diaphragm when they were cast monolithically? Oh, uh, yeah, I well, can suspect that the volumes, the masses are different. So there could be a difference, but we did not uh, notice any difference. Of course, if we had measured temperature evolution over time, then we would have uh, measured the difference. But overall, it is not relevant. Okay. Uh, was there additional? Uh, was the additional depth uh, deck removal at the abutment locations also accomplished with hydro demolition? Yes, everything. Okay. And then uh, we have a couple others here. Uh, why was UHPC used, or UHP FRC used for the curb, especially if it was cast separately? Was it required for strength? Or is it just no, durability? Durability. Okay. In, in Switzerland, all curbs are suffer from a rebar corrosion. Okay. So we uh, want to make a durable yeah. uh, curb. All right. Uh, what is the what is the suitability test? What is that? Ah, um, usually it consists in in casting on a certain surface uh, with the uh, inclination of the of the deck. So in our case, five percent, 
and and have the the contractor mix the mix that will be used, and the workers cast uh, the material on on this uh, deck, on this mock-up deck. That's usually the uh, uh, the test, and then we do uh, a quality control test like uh, pull-off tests and, and specimens in order to check the material and so on. Okay. Uh, a person said that they missed the missed the part on the. Do you, do you have a square foot cost for the bridge? Uh, yes, that's the surface of UHPFRC on top of the uh, concrete deck the existing one. So here I gave uh, a cost price per square foot of useful bridge service. Yes, ah, you, you, you want to have the value. I gave it in the presentation. Yeah, I thought I you did, re, yes. I can refine it here. 25 US dollar, dollars per square foot. Okay, that's good. And then um, I think that's got most of the questions up until we started in with the uh, question and answers. Kathy, uh, you are going to help if you can, or I can pick it up if we need to. I am here. Um, there were, it's amazing. Thank you, everyone, for sending in so many great questions. Um, there have been quite a few that have come in during the Q&A as well. So um, I'll, I'll kind of cherry pick some of the top ones. Um, did you pre-camber the, girder the girders fabricated with UHP FRC? Uh, you mean uh, which girder now? The one that, that you see on the screen right now, which is camber? Uh -huh. No. You mean the cantilever slab? It has a variable uh, thickness, yes. Um, let, let's take it bigger. Ah, you mean the existing, um, the existing if girder? You girder was, would you? No, no. No, there was no uh, pre-cambering. OK. Um, what is the unit weight of the UHP FRC concrete? Uh, very uh, slightly higher than for reinforced concrete. Okay, um, and I think you mentioned this. Is there a lightweight UHP FRC um, on market? No. no, I would not know how to do that because you cannot use lightweight aggregates because lightweight aggregates we have no aggregates in it, uh, so we have only uh, strong and hard uh, particles. Okay. I don't see how um, I can I, like that. Uh, another design question. I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, but what is the the matrix resistance to chloride ion penetration? Do you know that? Huh. When you do a test, essentially you measure nothing. So durability tests are among the most boring tests you can do on when you do it on <laughs> Much more interesting on reinforced concrete, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in Switzerland, um, are de-icing salts used? Oh yes, very much. Okay. Okay. Um, the win winters can be harsh still nowadays, but uh, yes, we use a lot of uh, de-icing salts. Um, and I think you talked about this one, but there have been a number of questions about the testing and um, ensuring that the bridge is ready to be opened. Can, can you talk just a little bit more about, I'm, I'm assuming the testing is in the specification, um, a little more on testing, if you would. Yes, the quality control uh, during the works consists in, in uh, uh, material tests on specimens that uh, were cast during the works. And uh, of course, we do a, a quality control, uh, a visual one. And already during casting, uh, we uh, ask for the uh, what we call a protocols of the mix, the mix uh, that has been used, the exact amount of of uh, material 
what has been mixed because we think that the, the most difficult part in UHPFRC works in UHPFRC casting is actually the fabrication of the fresh UHPFRC material. This has to be uh, in a perfect quality and we control there first. Great, thank you. Um, we haven't been able to get to all of the questions, but um, we will attempt to get all of the questions answered in the archives. So in the coming weeks, um, we'll take all of the questions, um, answer them, and then post them in the archives with the, the webinar. Um, Dr. Aziz and Amini, would you like to close? All right, okay. Thank you, Eugene. Eugene, let me ask you one question before we, before we, we, we close. Uh, it was interesting, you did some hand calculations and they mentioned that uh, one of your colleagues did the detailed finite element analysis, which gives you a better uh, idea as far as the, uh, the, con the, the effect of the rehabilitation. What was the comparison? Was the ratio you showed? Uh, can you show the, the, the slide that gave the ratio of the... Uh, Hand calculation over what was needed was 17% more moment capacity. Uh -huh. And then what did that change with when you did the finite element work? Actually, the, the reserves were even higher due to the detailed analysis. So the structure is significantly over designed in the end. So there are reserves. All right. But the, the hand calculation, the finite element, were they comparable or is it? Um, the, the finite element analysis gave uh, more detailed uh, results, results. Okay. And, right. and finally the uh, verifications were even, uh, uh, how to say, showed uh, more reserves. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. It was an excellent, excellent presentation. Thank and you very much. In the U.S. In the U.S. we have many many uh, bridges that needs the, the existing bridges that needs rehabilitation. The, Certainly, UHP FRC or UHPC, as we call it, is a very good solution. So, on that note, we are going to conclude our webinar.